Okay, chapter one lecture. And this chapter is about an introduction to individual income tax and understanding how taxes work. And this is a new book for this class. I do like how this book helps us understand how to approach learning about taxes. We'll look at an approach to taxes, you know, what you should expect, history, nature of the tax system, types of taxes. We'll really look at all the different types of taxes, how taxes are, how, how they work, the different types in that sense. Um, death taxes, estate gift taxes, how all that works together, employment taxes, and then tax administration, which is like the IRS, audit, settlement, statute of limitations. But we'll be going deeper into that in a really interesting way, doing some research with tax research software in chapter two and in our, our second lecture. We'll also look at practicing tax as a tax professional and then understanding federal tax law, economic, social, equitable, and political considerations. And you know, this is really important. Um, there's a lot of disdain for taxes and it scares me a bit, but I realize that part of the reason I have my perspective is because I've been educated in this area and I understand um, you know, how the system works, and where it came from and so I am happy to share that with you and I'll be mixing in some of my personal experiences throughout this um, and letting you know other things that I think are important as well. So our first section here is really approaching the study of taxation, expectations for learning about taxes. So I don't have tests in this class. I don't think that it's realistic and you know, I think it kind of wastes time. I would rather have you doing tax returns and realizing the plethora of what is tax. You know, people get degrees in taxes. And so we're taking one class in individual tax. So I would rather cover more and really for you to understand what you're looking for and what taxes are. So taxes produce revenue for governments. Right? And it can also be used in that regard politically to influence behavior of individuals or businesses because they're both the two major tax groups. So if you think about solar, when solar first came out, there was those tax credits to boost uh, that extra demand because it was convenient for private industry. Now it's not convenient for private industry, so they've taken away those boosters um, which is something I can get going on that I, I don't agree with, and I will have other videos about that um, on my YouTube channel. So taxes are what we pay for a civilized society. And this is where I always, you know, get confused when people forget about this and they act like paying taxes is like the dumbest thing you could do. They try to avoid taxes. Um, so this was a quote uh, from the U.S. Supreme Court Justice now, some common quotes you may have heard, nothing is certain except death and taxes. And, you know, death is, is kind of the most feared thing, right? So to put taxes in with death, I think, is quite telling and kind of really on contrast to, you know, taxes being what we pay for a civilized society. Um, sometimes I think that people are really just kind of spoiled with how good we have it in our society. And if they haven't really learned history, and we don't really teach history in most schools the way we should, um, you know, people t more take on this mentality. Um, and, and when people kind of disregard taxes or when taxes become too high, it, it can turn into a, a dangerous situation. So that quote is attributable to Benjamin Franklin. And it's true that we do pay taxes, whether directly or indirectly. Um, and that's what I was just getting to. You know, it really, when taxes get too high, which I, I do think they're there right now, um, the fact of the matter is, is that more people, people in lower income brackets are paying a higher percentage of tax than people in higher income brackets. And from a logical standpoint, and we'll get into this later, that just doesn't um, make sense. 
Now, what I find, which certainly comforts me a bit, is that most people do want to do the right thing and want to pay whatever is owed. So, yeah, um, you know, taxes, as we'll be learning here in a second, they were never meant to tax the lower class. All right, relevance to accounting and tax professionals. So if you are interested in the accounting and tax profession, um, you know, taxes are huge to this, and some wonder if that might be the reason that, you know, it's hard to get rid of the system, but I don't know many tax professionals who wouldn't be all about a flat tax starting at over 100000 um, It I'm a complete advocate of that. Um, and I have been in the tax industry and I would never, you know, not do that for a job. Um, and I don't really think that that's prevalent among tax professionals, although I know that a lot of the general public, I think, thinks that that's problematic for the tax industry. When it comes to finance, finances, there's always going to be ways um, for people to find reliable work. Okay, so... Tax impacts many areas of accounting. Compliance is a word that you'll hear a lot in the accounting and tax profession, and it just means complying with tax law. So there's that aspect for accounting and tax professionals. Then there's planning, right? Um, you know, tax planning is how many people, individuals, and companies avoid paying tax. Now, Tax avoidance is legal, and it's the art of avoiding taxes. Tax evasion is illegal, and that's breaking the law to not pay tax. Now, this really confuses a lot of people because a lot of people hear that corporations and high net worth individuals don't pay taxes, and they want to do the things that they're doing. But the way our system is set up is that you have to be spending a lot of money standard to benefit from these different rules and loopholes. And this is another issue in the broader picture, since we're talking about that in this chapter. You know, when you have the accounting and tax profession, the most profitable companies are hiring the best and the brightest to avoid taxes. And then you have the government, the IRS agents, you know, that are being hired through the government, how are they going to keep up preventing people from crossing the line into evasion? Because that's a lot of what happens in the government is you have the tax professionals figuring out, wait a second, that's really evasion. Okay, now we got to make another rule. Then the corporation says, okay, guys, hire more people, get on it. I can spend a million dollars planning to evade taxes because I'm saving hundreds of million dollars. And, you know, I think that you can see how none of this process adds value to our society, and that's always what I'm focused on. Financial reporting, so that's more of an accounting side, but then there's also all of the tax implications, which only a tax professional um, really knows. Controversies, obviously cash management because there's a lot of implications from taxes. For example, you don't want to overpay estimates um, even if, it, if even if you might actually owe that much, there's additional ways to manage things and essentially save taxes. So there's a lot that can go on there. So how to study taxes. You really want to focus on understanding the rules and why they're there. You know, when are they applicable? Why are they designated in a particular way? When are they relevant? And so that the goal is in your life, right, you can recognize, okay, this is something I've got to look more into. Um, and then that you actually know how to figure out how something is treated and where the instructions are and how to do that through research. So a brief history of U.S. taxation, I think it's pretty interesting and it's really helpful to have historical context for anything. How were governments funded? Can you think about this? You know, 
Before the U.S., how were governments funded? You primarily had a monarchy, right? And so it was the noble classes, basically a human hierarchy system, whereby you had families that were essentially thought to be connected to God, at least throughout the past 500 years um, in Europe, right? That was the, and then before that, it was single base rulers, often hierarchical in this similar way, where the nobility or the high class people owned property and based on their birthrights would inherit that property and the people who lived on that land would work the land and pay rents to them. And it, you know, that's how Britain and France and Spain, they were who funded the American colonies and there was also all sorts of money coming back from those efforts. Now in 1634, Massachusetts Bay Colony enacted the first income tax. I have a bit of a outline here, although one of my things is already showing. So moving on from 1634 to 1765, acts were being put in place by Britain. And it's interesting because if they hadn't tried to super tax the American colonies, there might have never been a need to separate from Great Britain. It was because they were putting so many taxes in place and they were so far away, right? Um, but it came down to taxes. That's what caused um, the war from Britain to separate and become American um, America. <laughs> so, or the United States of America, I should say. So 1765, they had the Stamp Act and this was a tax on using paper. And then in 1767, they had Townsend Act, which was on tea and imports, and you had the whole incident in Boston where they, the tea party, they dumped all of the products of tea into the water. Um, and so you had this escalating situation that led to that war. And during the war, to separate from Britain, the Americas, you know, they were funded by taxing everyone, which seems to have been generally popular. When they declared our independence on July 4th, 1776, that was treasonous, right? Um, the American colonies were run, or at least that large portion, by England. And so that was like treason. Um, and so once the war was won, we had the Constitutional Convention, 1787, where they wrote the, the Constitution. And then there was the Civil War. And during this time, there were pretty much, the government was funding itself through tariffs on import-exports, just like England had been doing. Uh, but now they did it to themselves in what they thought was a more just way. 1861 through, eight, or at least that's presumed, not necessarily. Uh, 1861 through 1865, Civil War. And both the North and the South funded the war through income taxes. Then after the war, they dissolved the income tax. In 1894, however, the North, um, or I, I think it was actually in the South, Put through, they put through an income tax, the, the government, federally, and it was challenged in the South, and I explained that already, um, and it didn't pass. I'll explain these last ones on the next slide here. So in 1894, there was this income tax was passed, in the South it was challenged, and they challenged it and they won in court based on the Constitution Section 8, so anyways, they won, so the income tax was repealed because it was unconstitutional. Uh, but what a lot of people don't understand is just because something's unconstitutional at that point, Congress has the right to change the Constitution, and it was never meant that the Constitution wouldn't need upgrades and amendments, and in fact, they started doing that right away. point was that the process to change the Constitution required people to work together and it's kind of a cumbersome process so that no one could just come in and say I'm changing stuff. Instead Congress has to follow a procedure, all these people have to talk and agree 
and pass an amendment. So in 1909, they passed a corporate income tax, um, and it was essentially considered the same as the excise tax, which was what they were doing with tariffs up until that point. And then the 16th Amendment was ratified. So this was the 16th time that the Constitution was amended, neutralizing the past court case. And when they amended the Constitution, it gave Congress the right to tax. The first 1040 was due on March 1st, 1914, in the Revenue Act of 1913. So that's the act that essentially established an income tax for individuals. That's Form 1040, which you will be very familiar with by the end of this course. All right, so in 1914, the personal exemption amount was $3,000 for a single person, $4,000 for a married person. Guys, or couple, <laughs> this is crazy. Um, in 2019, the amount is zero because they got rid of this as part of the... Um, Trump tax cuts, which were quite confusing in this regard because they showed some things as increasing, but some things they took away completely. So the net effect was certainly not at all what they had said it was. Of course, they didn't do the estimates um, as are normally done through the committees in Congress to understand what the effects of the bill would be before voting. In 2018, um, to give you some context, the amount for a single person was 4050 and for a married person it was double, which I think is fair, so 9000 Otherwise, you have people trying to file single, right? But um, married people get a huge benefit on the tax rate. So, at least these days, I'm curious as to what it was back then. So you can see, look, in 1913... $3,000 was a normal salary or a high salary. $4,050, it only went up by $1,050 in 100 years. I mean, that's crazy. Um, and so the equivalent, I looked up what the equivalent of $3,000 would be using... Um, time value of money and that sort of thing, bought purchasing power uh, using a, a website that calculates. And it came out to a single person earning 77748 and a married couple earning 103665 So I think just doubling this would be fair. That'd be like 150 for married couple. Great. And isn't it interesting that that's what they're talking about doing? Um, one party that I know is running for uh, election they're talking about getting rid of taxes under $100,000. And, you know, I think that that was really the intent of the initial Revenue Act. So what that essentially meant back then was that it was only a tax paid on the wealthy. And even within those rates, they were only paying a flat 2 to 6%. And honestly, guys, if you get rid of all of the cumbersome of our taxes... My guess is that 2 to 6%, uh, maybe 10% tops, I would say 10%, would probably be all that would be needed in a flax tax. That's how much the upper class are effectively evading taxes with our tax system. Um, and so back then, 2 to 6% was the range of income tax rate that you would pay over that exemption amount, so anyone over $3,000, so if you had $3,000, $10 times 2% was the taxes you would pay, and that top 6% rate only applied to incomes of over $500,000 in their money. So that was like your high, high end was a more than double rate. So 1913 to 1939, so what are those dates? Those dates are going into the war, right? So they needed more income. 1939, they did a codification, and they created the Internal Revenue Code, which we'll be definitely referring to in this class, called the IRC. You can always look the IRC up. Uh, in 1954, there was another codification, which is very much what we have now. And tax changes occur often. It so this is interesting. This is a percent of our government's current income by tax type. And we're going to be looking at all of these taxes 
next. So you can see here, payroll taxes are bringing in this portion, so less than 50, maybe 40%. We have individual income taxes bringing in 51%. And then we have excise taxes right here bringing in this small amount, duties, which is a similar, and then estate and gift taxes at 1%, and corporate income taxes at 8%. Okay, so next we're going to talk about the design of the tax system and the basics. So that's the Constitution over there. And what the amended Article 1, Section 8 says, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes. It did impose limitations, and that was when we got to the 16th Amendment, which changed some of those limitations. Now, states also have the power to impose taxes, um, but again, their constitutions can have various you know, limitations or guidelines. Whenever changes are being made, you've got to look to the governing documents and look at what the implication of changes would be and estimate what those changes are. So the basic tax formula, and guys, this should definitely go on your cheat sheet. So first we're going to, before we get into the actual basic formula, we'll go through kind of taxes and concepts. So tax base is something that you'll hear a lot. And tax base just refers to the amount that will be taxed. So on your income tax return, you may have your W-2 earnings, and that might be your tax base. But a lot of times people have more complicated situations, and it can take quite a bit of calculation and work to get to the tax base amount. It's not always intuitive, especially because you have other taxes being applied um, and all sorts of different scenarios which we'll be learning about. So the basic, basic concept is you got your tax base, the amount to be taxed, then you times that by your tax rate and that equals tax liability. And a lot of people don't understand this concept because on their tax returns, right, when you file your 1040, your tax liability is not the amount that you owe or that you get a refund, right? Because you've paid estimates throughout the year. And so that concept is often misunderstood. So we have three different types of, quote unquote, types of taxes. Proportional taxes, and that means a flat tax, which would just be five, everyone pays 5%. Progressive tax rates, as it sounds, it means that the rate is increasing, which is what we have in theory. We'll talk more about that. But so progressive means the rate increases as the base increases. Regressive means that the rate of ta the tax rate decreases as the base increases. Now, two things to realize. The we have the tax rate that we actually times by the tax base, but then we also have whatever the total income is, because in some of these calculations, we can take a lot of deductions and offset losses and do all sorts of stuff to get to the tax base. So if you actually take the, the tax liability divided by the total income, that rate could be something as low as, say, two, I've certainly seen four to five percent when the tax rate is in some of the highest brackets in the, the high 30s or 40s. Okay. So let's just look at a little bit of an example here. $10,000 tax base times 10 percent, a thousand tax liability. So that's a proportional tax. Let's just say it stays the same. Now we've got a hundred thousand, still 10%. We could do a million, still 10%. Taxes, tax liability, 10,000. In a progressive scenario, when we get to 150, the rate increases to 20%. So the tax liability would be 30,000. In a regressive scenario, when we get to 200,000, the rate decreases to 5%, and that would give us tax liability of 10,000. 
So this basic concept is something that can really be considered when they're looking at um, changing tax rates and knowing the amount of money that whatever government or whatever initiatives are being looked at, what they need to be funded, then you can change the rates, the base, the liability to determine how, you know, quickly, efficiently, how to have an impact on the system that's desirable. Now, our income tax system is progressive in concept. So, like, when you look at those rate schedules based on this amount, they look progressive. As your income goes up, the rate increases. But in reality, our tax system is often regressive. And it's because when people have millions of dollars of income, they're typically spending millions of dollars of income in investments, or certainly at least you know, a substantial portion of that. And so because of how everything is accounted for, which is what you'll be learning throughout this entire semester, those different offsets are what make the effective tax rate to be far lower than what middle class or most people pay in taxes. When I worked for the big four, I worked at uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers and I worked in KPMG and um, we would do high net worth individuals who ran the businesses that we were doing returns for. And I remember um, one guy, he, a couple, they owed $500,000. And my boss was like, oh, that's so much money. And I was like, are you kidding me? And I took their total income that year and divided it by the 500000 And, you know, they had, it was something like 5%, um, which is incredibly low. You know, we're all paying more than 5%. So we'll talk more about this. Um, another example is our Social Security tax, which we'll be looking at as well in this. And Social Security is flat until you reach the income threshold, and then it's zero. So as your income goes above that amount, the effective rate that you're paying decreases. So it's a flat tax until the threshold, and then it becomes regressive. Social Security applies on the first 120000 or so of income, um, and it's a flat tax rate, 12.3%. Once you get to that 120,000, um, it's zero. No one pays higher than that, which while I get the concept, I, I still think it's ridiculous to do it that way. Um, we can talk more about the concept later. So tax principles, and these are what our tax system was based on. The ability to pay concept, equity. We want our tax system to be based on the ability to pay. Certainty. We want the rules to be clear versus arbitrary and people can, you know, do whatever they want, which I would say we are fairly good at that, although they're quite complex. Convenience of payment. So that's why we have a pay-as-you-go or earn system, which is why taxes are withheld when you work uh, a job for a company, they have to withhold and send those taxes to the government for you. I can tell you this, someone can go off on their own, do their own business, be making the same amount of money, but when they have to take those taxes out and pay them, it is way more painful than when they're withheld by a company for you. Now we're going to look at types of taxes. So federal, state, and locality. Those are different locational taxes. Then we have property, transactional, transfers at death, gift, income, employment, and some proposed taxes. <clears throat> so the general rule to be aware of is that all income is to taxable unless specifically excluded by the IRS code. So nothing is deductible unless specifically allowed. That's kind of the other hand of it, right? Everything is included for taxes that you receive unless it's excluded. And then nothing is deductible except what is specifically allowed to be deductible. So that is a 
general rule. So our first type of taxes are property taxes. These can also be called ad valorem, uh, I believe that's Latin, and tax based on value for something that you've owned over time. So the most common are real property taxes. You pay taxes if you own a house, and this is how most states get their income based on real property taxes. They can be problematic because if someone has a house, say they inherit a home, but and it's a nice home, but they can't pay the taxes on it. So then they could be forced to sell, especially in places like Hawaii, where property values have skyrocketed, especially where I live, Kailua, um, huge problem. Personal use property. Oh, and, and states do have all sorts of ways of helping people stay in their homes in that sort of situation because the last thing you want to do is lower real property rates when you have skyrocketing value where people are coming in who have the money to pay. You don't want to reduce their property taxes. But um, And then the other real issue with property taxes is that the state government is dependent on the value of the homes and so it can create some negative motivation there where they can almost um, you know certainly play a real role in the market value personal use property so this is anything other than real property if you think about like boats different toys essentially that have a registration type tax a yearly fee um, so states and localities use property taxes, not federally. Your yearly estate tax, vehicle registration fees, sometimes they're considered uh, ad valorem, meaning that they're based on the value. For most states, it's only a portion of your vehicle registration fee, which is considered a property tax. The other amount is a fee. And you may have heard that these are deductible for taxes which can be very deceiving because it's only an itemized deduction, which means we're kind of deductible. You'll be learning all about that. <laughs> so transactional taxes, these are typically excise taxes. Whenever there's a sale of property, so like manufacturers selling trucks, tires, firearms, alcohol tax, fuel and gas, air travel, specific excise taxes, and then there's state and local excise taxes. So it's common for there to be federal ones and state and local ones. Typically the federal ones, they only apply to very specific industries, so they often don't apply to smaller, mid-sized businesses. Um, state and local excise taxes often do apply to smaller businesses, just like a sales tax, which is a transactional tax that's typically applied to the transaction and that's why when a state has a sales tax, the person selling the item collects the money and collects the state tax, and that's not their money. They have to give that to the government. So the, the major difference between a sales tax and an excise tax is that a sales tax is one transaction, excise tax is group of transactions, um, but of course it can get a lot more complicated than that because each state has the right to just make their own rules. Speaking of that, the state of Hawaii has uh, what's called the general excise tax, which is not a tax on the transaction, but a tax on the business. And it doesn't matter whether it's groups of transactions or, or one transaction, everything. It applies to everything. We'll be talking more about that one too. You're also, with the state of Hawaii, they're not required to pass the general excise or GET tax on to the consumer, but they can pass it on to this consumer. State doesn't care either way. You owe it whether you pass it on or not, because it's not a sales tax. Um, a use tax, so this is on a transaction or an asset purchase outside of the state, really to prevent people from trying to avoid the tax and instead when they do their taxes they're asked hey did you uh, do you own a use tax to buy anything in any other state to try and avoid our state tax you want to self-report it <laughs> severance taxes um, these are less 
common, or at least like less commonly talked about, because it's saying that the state has an interest in any like oil or gas, coal that they have in their state, and therefore as a private business, if you extract it, you're extracting the value from the state, so you need to pay a tax. Okay, so next category, transfers at death. So there are two main taxes, the estate tax, which taxes the owner, the owner's estate, and then the inheritance tax, which taxes the receiver of the estate. So an estate, in the simplest way to understand, if someone dies and they have assets, those assets, investments, property, it's all congregated into what's called an estate. Now you can do all sorts of estate planning and um, I believe we, we do get to that in this book. Um, so that'll be a great chapter to add into this class about planning um, for estate taxes and how to use trusts and all that. But regardless, if there's assets, it's essentially considered an estate when the person dies and the estate will pay a tax if necessary, most don't, um, to pass on the property. Whereas the inheritance tax is on the person who receives that property. Something to keep in mind, federally and states, these are like the two types that exist on this nature of wealth. Um, they're not gonna apply everywhere. So an estate tax, it's the tax on the right to pass the property at death, free of any other tax at death. Now, the federal government has an estate tax. It was part of that 1916 Revenue Act, which established the income tax. And in 2017, that amount was $5.5 million. So you get to exclude... 5.5 million, and you were only taxed above that. And the tax rates are far lower than our income tax. Now, but the, the 2017 Tax Acts and Jobs Act of December 2017, which was Trump cuts, changed it to 11.18 million, and it's called the Unified Transfer Tax Credit. And so essentially, you don't pay tax on the first 11.18 million. Now, the purpose of this tax, which is being more and more evaded, um, was to prevent wealth, huge, large wealth transfers from generation to generation, uh, because then you typically have this power play dynamic. And what this was meant to do, it's following the ability to pay, right? Um, there is the ability to pay tax here, so it should be taxed just like income. It's not even, it's at much lower rates, but that it would be taxed. So the calculation is the total assets, cash investments. That's the estate, everything that the person left behind. Now, because what you had happening is people sneaking money out before they died and giving all sorts of assets away, so that's where this gift tax comes in, which we'll talk about next. Um, but so for this calculation, we need to add all the taxable gifts. There's an exclusion, just like we have this 5.5 or 1118 exclusion. There's an exclusion for gift tax too that doesn't count at all. So essentially most people aren't being affected by this, or certainly lots of people are not being affected. And I just put in here, you know, gifts are not paying for someone's expenses. That's not a gift. A gift is simply handing value over. Um, so it's not typically something that is happening just because like a parent is paying for expenses for their child. So once you add back taxable gifts, that gets you to the estate tax base. And now we're using this term, our base. So like I said, there's various calculations that go into calculating the base. In this case, we had to add back taxable gifts because we know that people are going to make taxable gifts to try to reduce their estate tax. So that gets us to our estate tax base times the rate equals our total estate tax. Then we'll subtract gift taxes paid 
because remember, we're adding in taxable gifts made, taxable, so we paid tax. So from our total tax, we subtract the gift taxes paid and that equals the tax due. So this is similar to on your tax form, personal 1040, you calculate your total income tax liability, you minus the estimates you paid on your W-2, and you may have a tax due or a refund. Okay, so our second type is an inheritance tax, which again is on the receiver, because remember, general rule, all income is taxable unless specifically in included. Now, there's no federal tax, so you're free and clear on the federal side, um, but for states, they, they may have an inheritance tax. It, there's typically a base amount that's over the threshold that's taxed, just like with the estate tax. Um, Hawaii does not have an inheritance tax, but it does have an estate tax. However, it did not adopt the IRS doubling the estate tax. Um, and it's quite interesting that people don't care more about that doubling of the estate tax. I mean, going from 5.5 million to 11.18 million times a tax rate, I mean, that's it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some people won't even pay that much tax in their lifetime. So um, it, again, that's just a bigger shift onto the lower class to pay that. Um, so they've kept the amount, it's at 5.49 million, and then there's a progressive tax rate. So this is the Hawaii estate tax rate. So if you're t taxable estate, remember this is our base, so this is the amount above 5.4 million. So if you're 1 million over, you're going to pay 10%. If you're 2 million over, you're going to pay 11%. 3 million over, 12%. But let me tell you, everyone is planning to avoid this in Hawaii. And that's a problem when taxes get too large. Okay, and because of an estate tax that's too large, or I think income taxes too, whatever, I'm going to skip that, get in philosophical. So the types of taxes on gifts... In 1932, because they realized, right, the estate tax was enacted with the income tax, 15 years later, they realized, hey, people are just giving gifts now. So we've got to account for this. So gift tax is essentially looking at all the transfers made during one's lifetime. And then this works hand in hand with the excise tax. It complements the estate tax. So if someone gives the gift of property, so oftentimes family will say, hey, I'll sell you this house for a dollar so that it's legit. Well, no, the fair market value applies and the difference between what the person paid and the fair market value is considered a gift. So you get an exclusion on gifts. You don't, everyone gets to make a gift and it goes up by $1,000 a year. So in 2018, 15,000. And you can give different people $15,000 gifts. You just can't give, or, or once you give, you can give, <laughs> let's say a child, you can give them $15,000 in a gift. And quite frankly, that's a good strategy to move money tax-free. If you're elderly and you want to transfer money to a child, you could start giving a $15,000 or whatever the um, gift tax threshold is. You could give that as a gift each year, free of tax. So you give this amount each year, but the, the combining it with the inheritance tax essentially makes it so that it doesn't matter. That's the whole point. Um, and if you have two people, it's double. So spouses, they each get their own threshold amount. So it could be 30000 a year. Any amount over 30000 Okay, next we have the gift tax. So in 1932, they created a federal gift tax because remember, 
in 19, about 15 or so years earlier was when they enacted the Revenue Act, which had the income tax and the estate tax. And then they said, people are transferring money. <laughs> and so, you know, they're doing all these transfers to reduce and avoid the inheritance tax. So we got to do something about that. So they created the gift tax to complement it. And it's a very lenient tax, a gift tax. Um, and you can't avoid it by giving property. So what people used to think you could do is, I'll sell you, or they still think this, but I'll sell you this house for a dollar. That's That way it's legit, it's not a gift. Well. If you sell someone property for less than the fair market value, the difference between the fair market value and what they paid, that's a gift. So that's just circumvented right there. Um, then, so basically there's a threshold amount. So you can give a gift every year to as many people as you want. This is just to prevent people from avoiding, circumventing the inheritance or I'm sorry, the state tax, right? So only the taxable gift amount is added back to the state tax. So whatever the threshold amount is for a gift, this is basically an exclusion. Every person can give a gift to as many people as you want for up to $15,000. It's just when it comes to one person, when it goes over the 15,000, the giver, needs to pay a gift tax. It's not on the person receiving it, it's on the person giving it. And the amount above 15,000 is going to just be based on the estate tax rates, whatever the lowest, or if it gets that high, then it would apply to a higher bracket. But if it's in a lower amount, it's just going to apply to the estate tax. And then whatever that portion is above the threshold will be added back when you have the estate tax calculation. So you can get away with giving someone a gift of whatever the exclusion amount is each year to transfer money tax-free. And so that's a great strategy for people in lower income brackets where the estate tax rate isn't gonna apply anyways. So do, do a transfer every year when someone's in their elderly or into some sort of trust um, and that's, of course, we'll be talking more about all of that stuff um, in a later chapter. Planning to transfer money uh, by avoiding as much tax as possible. <laughs> okay, so now we're to income tax. Of course, we have federal income tax, state income tax, and then some localities have a tax. You know, state tax, state income tax rates tend to be much lower, and then locality tax rates are much lower. And there's only a few localities that do an income type tax. It's typically like a flat two or three or four percent um, or less. Now, tax on income, there are many types, right? The the rules are based on the type of entity, so individual or types of businesses. And individual rates are typically progressive. We talked about that already. They're increasing. Uh, whether in reality they don't tend to be progressive, but on, on paper the rates are. Then we have the corporate rates, which are a flat tax. Right now they're at 21%, which that was a, a cut. And then individual income tax, that was a cut, and it didn't used to be a flat rate. Corporate rates used to be progressive as well, which, you know, makes sense. The, the reason our income in corporate tax rates became progressive was to, con, you know, offset the increase in people effectively not paying as much tax. But this is really problematic, right? Because it's not affecting the issue directly. It's trying to symptomatically affect it. And then you have from what most people understand as like super high rates and they don't understand that the people in the higher income brackets are usually not paying those rates and so it just becomes you know really complex so the individual income tax um, is obviously the focus of this class and the federal income tax um, formula which we'll look at in a second it was not made simpler by our last, our last tax changes. They simply changed threshold amounts and amounts 
they got rid of that personal exemption, but they increased the standard deduction. You'll learn more about that later. So they got rid of one thing, but they increased another thing. They added another thing. They got rid of this. They made all sorts of changes. They did eliminate some very small nuanced deductions. But even with many of those, once the IRS implemented the changes and went back to Congress, Congress said that wasn't what we meant. Never mind. <laughs> so um, it's been uh, different for sure. So this is our income tax formula. This should definitely be on your cheat sheet. And I wouldn't have it taken up the whole cheat sheet, just like a quarter of the cheat sheet. And I would keep this handy. Um, and again, you can do more notes than just the cheat sheet. It's just all you're going to submit is one page that has the main things happening on there. So income broadly defined, all of your income, minus exclusions, so things that are specifically excluded, that gives us gross income. Then we get whatever deductions are allowed, and that brings us to this subtotal on the tax return that's very popular called AGI, or Adjusted Gross Income. And that number is used for a lot of deduction and credit calculations, so that's why it can be important. Then we subtract the greater of the standard deduction, a deduction amount everyone gets, it's like six, 7,000 for personal, double that for married. Um, however, it's been increased, so it's now more like 10, 11,000 for individual, double for married, um, or what's called the itemized deductions. And itemized deductions include all sorts of little things like the vehicle, ad valorem, I don't know, I can't say that word, vehicle property taxes, only the portion of your registration fees, that is a value-added tax, um, charitable contributions, and then all sorts of other ones like medical expenses, but only amounts that are over a threshold, and that threshold is based on a percentage of your adjusted gross income. So like, really difficult to take the itemized deductions, especially because um, in the tax cuts recently, we got rid of a personal exemption. So you can see here it says less personal and dependency exemption. These are no more. These are not here. Um, so they got rid of these and they made this bigger, making it harder to take the itemized deductions. Um, so then once you subtract... Um, the standard or itemized deductions, that brings us to taxable income. That's our base. And then we use our tax rate, and that gives us tax, total tax liability from our original equation. Then we can take away any credits, and this is why credits are more valuable um, in theory than a deduction of the same amount, because they're reducing your tax dollar for dollar, and then that's going to equal a tax refund or an amount due. So definitely take the time to rewrite this on your cheat sheet and have it handy. It can just be helpful when we're talking about different things to be able to refer to that. And even just writing it out can be really um, informative as well. So now we're on to income taxes. Um, you know, states have their own laws in regards to income taxes, but the state tax is typically based on the federal. And so most softwares like whether they're preparer-based softwares, like the one we're going to use, Intuit Pro Connect, or whether it's a DIY tax software like TurboTax, you can't just go in and do your state taxes. You have to do your federal taxes first. Now, this is a law concept that I'm talking about here on the PowerPoint, and what I'm saying in, in practice, what this means is that you can't do one without the other. You have to do your federal tax in software because the states are never independent of federal. So many things are based on the federal. Now, that doesn't necessarily make it simple because, for example, with those tax changes, every state decides which one do we want to implement, which one don't we want to implement, what do we just want to be different, um, and there's all sorts of... So some states 
depend more on the federal calculation than others. Some are less so and they'll just kind of do their whole tax uh, return over again. But with softwares, you always have to do federal first. Uh, and so what I was just explaining is called decoupling. So the states can decouple from federal tax law changes. Now, nexus is a word you should know. Nexus is the state's right to tax you, which of course is based on their own constitution and governing documents. Typically, if you live in a state or you work in a state or that area, locality or otherwise, then whatever their governing documents are can tax. Now, sometimes you can live and work in multiple states. Um, income is typically not double taxed in states. So if you move, you pay tax in one state, tax in another, states will typically give you credit in one way or another for the taxes you paid for another state and they don't double tax people. Um, many states have sales or excise or use taxes like we talked about. A few have none. Seven states have no income tax. Now employment taxes. So these are the extra taxes you see on your paycheck, except for box two is your estimates that are made throughout the year. All of the other boxes are your Social Security and Medicare taxes. Now, employment taxes are withheld from your pay when you're a contractor or called self-employed, 1099, you might have heard of this, 1099 worker, independent contractor. If you're self-employed, which is essentially the same thing as you being a business, it just means no one's withholding these taxes for you. When you're in that position, they're called self-employment taxes. When you're employed, they're called employment taxes, but they're the same taxes. The difference is when you're self-employed, you're going to pay more of them than when you're an employee, because when you're an employee, the business splits them with you. Um, like I said, when you're an employee, these self-employment taxes are split with you, becoming employment taxes. And so you pay 7.65% and the business pays 7.65% and then they deduct those expenses as an expense. Um, Self-employed on Schedule C, they pay it all, 15.3%. Uh, 7.65 times 2. However, to make it fair, right, because the self-employed person, they're both the employee and the employer. So because the employer pays half and deducts it as an expense, on the Form 1040, self-employed people actually get a deduction for 50%. Medicare, 1.45%. Social Security, 6.2%. That's that 7.65% that you pay, that you see on your paycheck. When you see that amount, in addition to federal estimates, you'll see Medicare and Social Security. Um, the Affordable Care Act providing health care to certainly everyone in our lower income populations, it was being funded essentially through this additional Medicare tax, which only applied to people who earned income over $200,000 for single or two hundred fifty dollars for married, and it was 0.9%. There's also another uh, tax on investment, higher investment incomes. It had a higher threshold as well. But overall, a very small tax to pay for expanding health care. Um, so I think that was thing. Unfortunately, it's been severely damaged um, its ability to be effective. Social Security, remember we said that this was regressive because these are those threshold amounts I couldn't remember. In 2017, you only pay Social Security 6.2% on your first $127,200 in 2018, it's $128,400. Um, and so then as you earn more income above that amount, your effective tax rate decreases. Okay, so the unearned income tax, this was the other tax for affordable care. And the concept here was that it was only on unearned income. Unearned income, sometimes called passive or investment income, is on earnings, right? And so it was 3.8% on net investment income. Um, 
when the total income from those investments exceeded 200 or 250,000. And so that means that on average, this tax is only applying to people with about $8 million in assets. And that's just when it's starting, right? <laughs> like, and so we're talking about people with substantial investment income. Uh, FUTA taxes, this is federal uninsurance tax, and this is for, uh, I'm sorry, uninsur unemployment uh, t insurance, which works pretty well. There's a federal tax, it's very low, but it works in tandem with the state tax. Lastly, we have miscellaneous state and local taxes, franchise taxes, which are on corporations or business for the right to do business. An example of this in California, LLCs, regardless of how much money they make, uh, have an $800 per year tax, even if they have no income. And this amount increases if they do have higher thresholds of income. Occupational fees, so something like the CPA, a Certified Public Accounting, these different occupational um, industry certificates and this type of monitoring that's done by the state's regulation of those occupations. And so therefore there's some sorts of occupational fees that are effectively meant to offset the state running and overseeing those areas. Okay, proposed taxes. So a flat tax has been widely proposed. I am a huge fan of it. And I think in general, people like the flat tax. Um, a VAT tax is a value added, which is common in um, Europe, and it's essentially a sales tax. Um, sales taxes is a bit of an issue because you're taxing people who are spending their money, right? And so it can have the effect um, of not necessarily following the ability to pay, um, even though it is something people have control over. So you can circumvent that by, say, only putting value-added tax on non-necessities, which a lot of states do with sales tax. So they don't tax uh, groceries, but they tax hot dinner, hot meals, prepared meals, that sort of thing. Uh, a national sales tax has been brought up a few times, so federal putting on a sales tax. Uh, but again, it's the same thing like I was just saying. It can really favor the wealthy because they're not going to be spending, you know, a large portion. Okay, tax administration. So guys, the Internal Revenue Service, IRS, it's under the Treasury Department. Their mission is to provide America's taxpayers top quality service by helping them understand and meet their tax responsibilities and enforce the law with integrity and fairness to all. That's the IRS's mission. Um, and so they're responsible for administering tax law. One issue is that it is really cumbersome in the U.S. to keep records for taxes. And one thing that I find people often don't realize is that a large reason our tax system is so complicated has definitely been um, politically encouraged. Um, what I mean by that is, uh, for example, this is a little disconnected, but TurboTax lobbied millions of dollars for multiple years for the IRS to stop building a tax system that would have allowed taxpayers to file directly with the IRS. Now, um, different politicians, largely more a conservative methodology in, in alignment with conservative methodologies, have said, hey, we don't want the IRS to tell us, we don't want it to have anything to do with the IRS. The benefit with having us file our taxes directly with the IRS is that then issues that come up, you know, if issues come up when you file with TurboTax, it's on you. The, the uh, court cases have said using TurboTax is not the same as hiring a professional, which gives you a little bit of extra kind of cushioning uh, because you are at least trying to do some, you know, due diligence. Uh, but TurboTax doesn't count. And I've seen situations where people were held liable for things that I don't think that they should have been. And TurboTax has the resources to make their system better.
they don't make their system better because they don't have to. And so those are profits um, because of their lack of competition. So the point being is that all of this in our day-to-day -day lives creates more difficulty. Whereas if we're filing directly with the IRS, then things become much easier because they're going to get to improve that process real time with real time feedback. Internationally, governments will tell taxpayers what their tax bill is. The IRS has the power to do that. They have all the information being filed with them to do that. They don't do it because that sort of, you know, we don't want the IRS to tell us what tax, to, you know, we want to record it ourselves. So we create this huge record keeping burden and stress on this process that happens every year um, in the name of freedom, right? So that's just something that, um, you know, I want to add in about my real life situations. So then when it comes to people out there in the world, I find that there are two types. There's people with too much fear about the IRS, and then there's people with too little fear about the IRS. So when people have too much fear, they're trying to do things right. They research and they stress and they ask questions, but they're overdoing it, right? They genuinely report their situation correctly. And I threw in that they may be stubborn about one, one thing here or there that they think they've got right, but gosh, who can blame them? The system is complex. These people, you know, I'll try and say, look, you're doing things right. If you get a letter from the IRS, you want to respond to it. Uh, you never ignore the IRS, but you're genuinely doing things correctly. You know, people with too little fear, they can be blatantly ignoring certain taxes, saying that it won't matter, they don't care. Um, with those people, I try to install a healthy dose of fear. Because remember, it only takes one audit to correct many years of bad behavior. And those amounts can be huge, especially with compounding, or not compounding, but penalty and interest um, over time. So selection for an audit. Yes, that's what we're talking about here. Um, computer systems do information matching these days. So they're able to quickly identify, say, if a company files a W-2 and the employee files their tax return on ta TurboTax, or what I recommend, Free Tax USA, actually free, um, were the W-2 amounts correct? Um, it's done really quickly, it's computerized, and they'll just send a notice to the taxpayer and correct the taxpayer's return all in one automated um, action. So, and that's why it's on the taxpayer to get a form correct. If a company gives you a form, any type of form, and it's not correct, you need to go back to the company to get it corrected. That's the easiest and fastest way to rectify the situation. There are other routes, I won't be going into them right here, but they require filing forms and doing all sorts of steps. Another way that people are selected for audit is computer scoring based on algorithms. Again, computers can identify who is probably most likely to be non-compliant, which means they're not following the rules. Remember, compliance is following tax rules. So types of audit, and remember an audit is just checking, verifying an amount on a tax return, verifying that the tax return is correct. But there are different types of audit. So there are correspondence audit, which these days are the majority of audit, and they're just asking for proof or backup or a receipt or checking on a number. Then there's office audits, which are very specific in scope. So they're looking at one thing on your return. My example here is say a mileage deduction on a self-employed tax return, because you're supposed to have a, a mileage log of all of your business trips. So do you have that? And that could be done in office. These are conducted in the IRS offices. And then there's field audits. And that's when you're in a full-blown audit situation. People are coming to your location multiple times, maybe unannounced and they're actually auditing what they think is a bigger uh, situation. So a full-blown audit or an, any audit can result in additional tax. That's typically why it started. Um, and it's called an assessment. They're assessing 
a tax that you didn't pay. Um, and sometimes there's a bit more checking that can go on. Maybe something is discovered and oftentimes that could have been deducted as well. So then the amount to pay is negotiated, worked out with the agent. And during an audit, a settlement, which is what I just described, is often reached. Um, but if there is no settlement, and let's say the auditor decides, or examiner, as they're called, decides that the full amount stands, then the taxpayer can appeal it with the IRS at the appeals division. Um, now, the courts can actually decide the case based on hazard of litigation, which means the most likely results from similar cases that have already been determined. Um, payments can be reduced or eliminated. Um, the taxpayer, if it's still not determined in their favor, which is often, uh, they can continue to litigate at tax court, federal district court, and court of federal claims. Um, it's discouraged because of high costs and outcomes. So the statute of limitations. So the lawsuit by an IRS say assessing additional tax or auditing a return, it must be brought within a reasonable period of time. So it's been defined as the IRS has three years from the later of, one, the due date of the tax return, or two, when the taxpayer filed it. So if you don't file a return, then there's no statute of limitations. Now, if but this is, in, this is in everything. So if more than 25% of your income is not reported, then that changes the statute of limitations to six years. Now, if your return is fraudulent, there's no statute of limitation, and that means intent to deceive. If the intention to deceive is there, if it's a fraudulent case, that's going to make it criminal. Now, let's say limitations on your refund. A lot of times people will see, oh, I didn't meet the threshold, I don't have to file. But if you worked a W-2 job, they probably withheld some tax and you could get that back. So for whatever reason, there's a lot of situations where someone might have a refund, maybe they filed their return incorrectly and it wasn't caught by the IRS. Well, you can amend, it's called amend that return to get a refund. Um, as long as you file the return within three years from the date you originally filed it, or if you didn't pay the taxes until later, then it's two years from when you paid the tax. So if you didn't pay the tax with the return, it's two years after the tax was paid. Okay, interest and penalties. So interest applies to any tax that's not paid by April 15th, the due date of the return. You can file an extension, but it's an extension to file, not pay the tax. So you've got to pay in whatever you think you might owe if you want to avoid um, interest on that. And then whatever the interest rates are, they're pretty reasonable. They're based on existing federal short-term rates, which right now are around 4%. Uh, penalties apply if you fail to file the return by a due date, 5% per month, up to 25% of the tax. Failure to pay the tax by the due date can be 5% per month, up to 25% of the tax. Two failures are often applied at the same time. What happens is that one reduces the other, so you're really only ever paying a penalty of 5%. Um, negligence. So if you intentionally disregard the rules, just like that changed the statute of limitations so that the IRS has more time to identify you, it also changes your penalties. It goes up by 20%, intentional disregard of the rules. Fraud is up to 75% of the tax or more. It's intent to deceive. There's intentional disregard for the rules. Intent to deceive. One is, I didn't pay attention to the rules. The other is, I tried to deceive. Right? So they're different. And then there's civil fraud, which is 75% plus fines. Criminal fraud is can be even larger fines, the same or larger, 25%. 
and jail time. So the, uh, the difference here is one degree, and it's the, the level of willingness that occurred. Now, the burden of proof is on the IRS to prove this. Um, however, when it comes to things like there's always that common thing that some of the biggest criminals have been brought down ultimately by the IRS. So tax practice. So doing tax return preparation or other services um, in the industry, that's called tax practice. Who can do taxes? Well, a lawyer or JD as they're called, certified public accountant, CPA, and an enrolled agent. I maintain an enrolled agent. And the difference here is a CPA is an accounting distinction and it's by state and it includes taxes. Enrolled agent is a tax distinction by through the IRS. Um, and uh, whereas CPAs can be state specific and some states won't allow a CPA from another state, an enrolled agent can work in all states. That was why I ended up going with the enrolled agent versus maintaining a CPA. The other reason is because enrolled agent is much cheaper. <laughs> um, so, you know, industry plays a role in regulation. The Affordable Care put restrictions in place because the tax profession wants who can do taxes to be regulated. And the IRS wants that as well because people get ripped off by tax preparers who give people big refunds. You may have heard someone say before, oh, go to him, you get a big refund. Well, they're responsible for what's being put on their return and, you know, the I, you would think someone who's doing tax returns is doing something that's legal. And so that's where the IRS put the registered tax return preparer in place so that anyone who did taxes at a minimum would have to be registered tax return preparer. And then one of these people for bigger businesses and more complex situations like international taxes. However, it was struck down by the courts that said the IRS cannot, cannot require registration, even though they have the right to regulate preparers. So ethical guidance, um, you know, there's a lot on ethics and it's an interesting topic. Uh, statements for standards for tax services. These are extensive requirements to ask certain questions, to document, to complete due diligence and challenge discrepancies. You know, if someone tells you something and you don't think it makes sense, you need to ask them. Um, and then document that you ask them. And it's, it's just, there's a ton of requirement. If, for example, a tax preparer sees prior year errors in your returns, because typically a tax professional should ask for your prior year return in preparing your current year, then they're required to tell you of those errors, but not necessarily um, require you to fix them. Unfortunately, it's become a big industry where people will charge fees almost just as much as whatever the person is getting back and amending. Um, statutory penalties imposed on tax return preparers can be quite, um, you know, for small procedural things, they're reasonable, smaller fees. Um, but for unreasonable recommendations and understatements of taxes on returns, effects of inflation, indexing amounts each year, which is why you see in 2016 it was this amount, in 2017 it was this amount. That's indexing for inflation, which is not always done evenly. Uh, and then political considerations. This is huge. There's so many different things that are based on political and government-related aspects. Um, the IRS is a protector of revenue. You know, they are simply, it needs to be administratively feasible for them to do their job. And right now there's a real, we'll, we'll be looking at this more in chapter two, but the IRS has quite a bit of challenge between Congress and then the influence of courts and then court cases. And so that's what a lot of people don't understand. Some, sometimes in a situation where the law doesn't specifically apply, you have to look to court cases, but a lot of this can only be understood by a professional who's aware of the updates and aware of the interpretations and aware of many things. Whereas an average taxpayer might find one court case and compare it to theirs and say, oh yeah, this is it, uh, when in reality it may not be.
all that there is about it. Now, one thing I think you should be aware of, taxpayer advocacy. So this is a service that is an independent IRS organization dedicated to providing justice and improving the IRS. It's a free service for eligible taxpayers, which means something has happened to that taxpayer. You've had an issue that you can't get resolved. You have done the things. You have contacted the numbers on, on your paperwork, or maybe you ignored everything for a while, and now you're trying to get everything fixed. Whatever the case, you can head into the TAS. There's an office in every state, um, and they do a lot of work to help people. And that is the end. Great job with this week's lecture. Do post any comments below this video. Ask your questions. Otherwise, I'll see you in next week's lecture. Bye.